two, one. Um, thanks for having me. So today I'm going to talk about axon assisted string effect. My name is Yohei Emma. I'm now working as a postdoc at Daisy, and I will move to the University of Minnesota this fall. Um, this talk will be based on this paper in collaboration with Barry Tomke and Kyohei Mukaira. And then we also have another paper, which is closely related to today's topic. So if you find my talk today interesting, then maybe you want to also check this paper. OK, so yeah, let me proceed. So in this talk that uh, today, uh, I'm going to study the Schwinger pair production in the presence of the uh, in this slide, I will just explain why motivation. Okay, I don't know for me or maybe for us. Uh, you know, the first motivation is the it's just for fun. Like uh, it is really fun to solve the draft equation in the presence of the electric field and also the axon. But we also, of course, have another you know other phenom motivations, and one is the axon inflation. Okay, so if you identify the axon as the inflaton, then uh, you know you can, uh, for instance, think of this kind of coupling between the axon and the U1 gauge field. And then uh, it is well known that this kind of coupling induces a tachyonic gauge field production. And then uh, a lot of interesting phenols like the you know, same being on the scientists, gravitation waves, PBA, so on and so forth, are discussed in the literature. But then, uh, you know, if you think of, for instance, this U1 gauge field as the standard model, standard model gauge field, then of course there are you know, fermions that are charged under this U1 gauge field. And then, uh, once the, this gauge field, uh, gauge field is produced, then, then uh, this gauge field in turn will produce the fermions. And then uh, once they produce, this fermion production will back react to the gauge field production and uh, maybe stop the gauge field production. So in order to understand this whole uh, system, then uh, you have to inevitably study this kind of fermion production process. Okay. And then uh, you know, here I just commented on axon inflation, but the, the same can be said to the relaxon model if you, you for instance, the use the target and gauge field production as a friction term for this relaxon. So these are kind of the motivations. Okay. And then in this talk, as I said, I will discuss the Schwinger effect in the presence of the axon. But in order to understand what's going on in the case with the axon, then it is better to first understand what's going on in the case without the axon or a simpler case, like the standard case. Okay. So in this and the next slide, I will explain what's going on in the case of the standard Schwinger effect. Okay. And then the Schwinger effect is, of course, the particle pair production process in the presence of a really strong electric field. So it is just saying that you know, if you impose a really strong electric field, then an electron and poson pair just pops out from vacuum. So that is the Schwinger effect. And then that can be formulated in the following way. So in this talk, I will always, always assume that there exists a constant electric field in the Z direction. Okay. And then you can just uh, take the temporal gauge so that the AMU is given by this. And then in this gauge, and then you can just compute uh, the, the dispersion relation of the fermion in the presence of this gauge field, and that is given by this. Okay. And uh, here PD is the you know, transpass moment, uh, PX squared plus PY squared. And then this M is the fermion mass time. And what is more important is that here you have this kind of factor. And then this is just saying that you know, if you impose the electric field, then the charged particles, charged particles will be accelerated in that direction. Or, uh, in other words, the, you can define the, the so-called generalized momentum pi c, which is given by this, and then this is the you know, increasing with time. Okay. And then this in particular means that the frequency now depends on time. And then uh, in general, if the frequency depends on time, then the positive and negative frequency modes will be mixed with each other as the time evolves. And that can be interpreted as a particle production. And then in our specific case, then we can just solve the drug equation and then see uh, how the spectrum looks like. Okay. And then uh, in this talk, uh, I will first show. Uh, so here I will first show the numerical results and then explain the features of the spectrum. And then after that, I will try to explain how we can understand that more intuitively. Okay. So in this slide, I will just explain the numerical results. So here, the horizontal axis is the, the uh, PC, and the vertical axis is the occupation number. Okay. And then in our specific case, then the spectrum will look like this. Okay. So um, you know, as you can see that there exists a plateau. And then the width of this plateau is, uh, is a proportion to the duration of the time which you impose the electric field. So in this uh, specific case, the, I just impose the electric field from 0 to 100 in, in this unit, g is equal to 1. So that's why uh, there exists a plateau from minus 100 to 0. Okay. And then an important point is that the height of this plateau is well approximated by this formula. Okay, so that this is the occupation number, and then it is exponentially suppressed both by the mass of the female and also the transpass momentum of the female if you consider non-zero PD mode. 
And then uh, this uh, result can be intuitively understood in the following way. So here I will use the Juraxi picture. So these are the you know, uh, negative energy states and these are the positive energy states. And then these different burns are corresponding to different PD. And then uh, the Juraxi picture tells you that uh, all these negative energy states are occupied and all these uh, positive sta energy states are unoccupied or empty. That is the vacuum. Okay, so they are filled and they are unfilled. That is vacuum. And then, uh, for instance, you can uh, focus on this specific particle in the drug C. And then, once you impose the electric field, then of course, this particle will be accelerated. So, this will go to this direction. And then at this point, where the pi z is equal to zero, then the gap between these negative energy states and positive energy states uh, are the smallest, right? So, at this point, with some probability, so it is mo most probable that at this point, this particle can jump to the positive energy states. So with some probability, it can jump. And this is corresponding to, of course, the particle production process. And then after that, it will again be accelerated and goes to this, this direction. And then here, what is important is that the gap size at this uh, point is controlled by this parameter. So here, mt is the, you know, the transverse mass. So it is just a scale root of PD scale plus M scale. So the, because the gap size is controlled by this parameter, and the suppression factor is also controlled by this parameter. Uh, this is what we saw in the, in the last figure. Okay? And then we can also quantify this more by using the phase integral method or WKB analysis or Stokes phenomena and so on and so forth. But the, yeah, uh, I don't have enough time to explain that, but the, you know, this kind of story is also really fun. So if you want to know more, then you can ask me later. And then so far I discussed the case without the axon. And then from now, I will try to explain what, what happens if you include the axon. Okay. So here uh, in this talk, I will include all the dimension five operators of the axon fermion gauge field system. So in particular, if you focus on the fermion sector, then the equation will be given like this. Here, d mu is the covariant derivative. And of course the gauge field is uh, contained in this uh, d mu. And then what is more important is that you can now think of two kinds of the axon fermion couplings. One is this one, where the axon appears in the face of the Mars sun. And the other one uh, is this, uh, like the derivative coupling between the axon and the fermion current. Okay. And then uh, again, uh, I will first explain. So it is the, you know, not so difficult to solve this direct equation numerically. So I will first explain the, our numerical results. And then after that, I will try to explain how we can understand that numerical results more intuitively or physically. So here uh, in our numerical uh, results, we impose the constant electric field and also the constant axon velocity, which is in particular the case uh, for the axon inflation because the drawing inflation axon is slowly evolving. And the results are uh, shown, uh, shown in these uh, you know, figures, but you know, here we are just taking two different model parameters. So for instance, you can just focus on this left panel. And then here, the horizontal axis is the PC and the vertical axis is the occupation number. So the same as before. And then in this case, the, in this, uh, for this blue line, we are checking the tail dot to be zero. So tail dot is defined by this. So this uh, means that you know, uh, it is proportional to the axon velocity. So this case corresponds to the case without the axon. So that same as before. Then the hydro is given by the previous formula. Okay? So there exists a plateau and the hydro is given by the previous formula. And then uh, as you can see that as one increases the axon velocity, then uh, there still exists a plateau, but the height of the plateau is really enhanced a lot. Like uh, it depends strongly on this axon velocity. And then for instance, in this case, that uh, this is 10 to min minus 10, but the, you know, for this line uh, it is 10 to minus six. So this enhancement is really huge, okay? And then we call this kind of enhancement as the axon assisted shrink effect. And then uh, sometimes it is not even a monotonic function of the axon velocity. So in order to take a closer look at you know, what's going on uh, for the height, then in this slide, I plot the occupation number versus the axon velocity by fixing the PC to be this value, okay? And then minus 50 is corresponding to this point or this point, okay? So we are just plotting the height of the, of the plateau versus the axon velocity by ju just uh, uh, you know, picking up the, the most at the middle of the plateau. And then the results are given by this. And then again, uh, we are just uh, taking two different model parameters. So you can just focus on this uh, left panel. And uh, you know, X axis is now the axon velocity and Y axis is the you know, occupation number. And then I will mention this gray line later. So you know, for now, you can just focus on this blue line. Okay. And then uh, if you take the axon velocity to be zero, 
then uh, that is corresponding to this point, and this point is uh, given by this formula, which I gave uh, last time for previous slides. So the same as before. But once you increase the axon velocity, then as you can see that it is enhanced a lot like this. Okay. And then if you for, focus, for instance, on the envelope, then the envelope approaches to, to this formula, like uh, this formula. Okay. So in other words, if you take the axon velocity to be larger and larger, then the suppression factor coming from the PD is eventually gone, even if you consider non-zero PD mode. And then on top of this enhancement, the height oscillates uh, with as a function of the axon velocity, as you can see like this. Okay. So uh, we call this kind of enhancement of the Schrodinger pair production rate for the non-zero PD mode as the axon narcissistic Schrodinger effect in our paper. Okay. And then so far, you know, they are just the numerical results, so they are they are like this. But the you know, uh, from now I will try to explain how we can understand this more intuitively or physically. So the, from now, the, I will just discuss the interpretation of our results. And then uh, numerically, it is not that tough to you know, solve the full Dirac equation, but the, you know, analytically, it is really tough to analyze the you know, full Dirac equation. So here, I wanted to rely on some approximation scheme to simplify the system. So in this slide, I will just take the normal typisk limit, uh, saying that m, the mass of the fermion, is the largest parameter of the theory. Okay. So let me emphasize that this is just for simplicity. So sometimes numerically, uh, we take the M and the PD to be comparable, but the here in this lab, just for simplicity, I will assume this. And then if you assume this, then you can just simplify the Lagrangian. For instance, you can just write down the uh, Lagrangian for the positive frequency two component spin at eta. And then uh, the data is given by this, okay? So this one is just a usual term. And then this one, if you uh, ignore the axon velocity, then uh, this is just a pi square divided by two M. And then pi, as I said, pi is a kind of generalized momentum. So you can equally think of this as kind of p scale divided by 2m. So, so that is the usual kinetic energy. But once you introduce the axon velocity or axon coupling, then the, on top of this term, you also have this kind of term. Okay. And then here, sigma is corresponding to the power matrix. So this means that there exists the interaction between the momentum and the spin of the fermion. So in other words, the axon induces spin momentum interaction of the fermion. And then with this spin momentum interaction, you can just study the dispersion relation of the equation motion for this area. And that is given by this. And then here again, if you ignore this uh, you know, uh, axon velocity, then uh, this is just the usual kind of energy, like the pi scale divided by 2m. And then, uh, you know, as I said, the, in order to understand the exponential separation factor, uh, it is really important to understand the gap size. And this controls the gap. So if you think of this as a function of this pi c, the minimum value of this is the gap size. So, and then without axon velocity, then gap size is, is of course given by PD scale divided by 2n. So there exists a separation factor coming from PD. But once you turn on this side of theta dot, non-zero theta dot, then the gap size becomes smaller and smaller if the theta dot is non-zero. And then eventually it is gone if the theta dot is uh, larger than PD. So in other words, the, you know, the separation factor coming, so that if the gap is gone, then the separation factor, we expect that the separation factor is also gone. And that is exactly what we saw in our numerical results. So in other words, uh, this spin momentum interaction can compensate the separation factor coming from the transverse momentum. Okay. And then here, you know, in this uh, you know, two lines, the, we just relied on the normalistic limit, but we also found that it is not really mandatory to assume the normalistic limit. As a matter of proof, indeed, we found that the following empirical formula reproduces our numerical results quite well. So this is the formula. And then here we are using the relative, relativistic version of this uh, you know, dispersion relation in the exponent. Okay. And then uh, this formula is corresponding to this gray line. And as you can see that it agrees pretty well with our numerical results. So from this, we can say that, you know, although this is empirical formula, from this, we can say that you know, this uh, dispersion relation is really important to understand the particle production. And then uh, because of the time limitation, I don't have enough time to explain any details, but the, actually this second term is causing the oscillatory feature, this feature. And then uh, here pi plus and pi minus are defined as the, this point. And then uh, this is sometimes called turning points. So you can think of this uh, oscillation as a result of the interference between two turning points. Yeah, I don't have enough time to explain uh, more details, but uh, if you want to know more details, then you can ask me later or you can just check out papers. Okay. Yeah, so that's it. So let me summarize my talk. 
So the rate of the standard Schrodinger effect is suppressed both by the mass sum and also the transpass momentum of the period. But the once you, you know, it include the axon, then the axon velocity assists the production, and then the suppression factor from PD can be gone. So the rate can be proportional to this. And then this kind of effect can be interpreted as a uh, result of the action induced speed momentum interaction. Yeah, that's it. Thank you.